Vaccines have not eliminated the Chinese Fauci virus, so we all need extra protection for our immune systems. My friends at Centurion Labs have combined five key ingredients to defend your immune system against allergies, cold, the flu, and even the coronavirus. It's called Centurion Defender, and it incorporates vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, copper, and quercetin in just one capsule. No more swallowing 10 pills a day or not taking supplements because the individual cost is just too high. So take one Defender with breakfast and one with dinner and keep living. Living your life. Just like the Centurions of Rome led by example and held themselves to the highest possible standards, Centurion Labs has dedicated the last 15 years to research and develop safe, effective, and affordable healthcare products made in the USA that you can trust. For a limited time, listeners of this show can save 20% off their first order of Centurion Defender. Visit centurionlabs.com forward slash Jenna and use the promo code J-E-N-N-A. Defend your health today with Centurion Defender. That's centurionlabs.com forward slash Jenna and the promo code Jenna. Centurion Labs, that's with an S, centurionlabs.com forward slash J-E-N-N-A. As a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump, Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Well, welcome back to The Jenna Ellis Show. And joining me now is my good friend, Dave Rubin, who's host of The Rubin Report and somebody I always turn to for good advice, snarky perspective. And of course, he is on Locals as well. So uh, Dave Rubin, thanks so much for joining me here on The Jenna Ellis Show. Jenna, it's good to be with you. A little good advice and some snarky wisdom. I feel like that could be on my epitaph one day. That'll be you know, it right put it there. on put it on the business card. That'll be the new mantra. And I always appreciate snarky so much. And you know, speaking of snarky, you now can be super, super happy and as snarky as you want to Gavin Newsom because you are in the free state of Florida. How is that going? It is absolutely freaking spectacular. I got here about five weeks ago. Uh, we didn't get into our new house till about a week ago. So I'm in my temporary studio right now, but my entire team moved from California. So I took a whole bunch of productive, good, decent citizens out of LA and we are now in the free state of Florida. Look, of course the weather is great here. Of course the taxes are low, but that's not really what it's about. What it's about here is the spirit of freedom. And, and maybe that sounds corny at some level, but it really is not. People here, because they live freely, because Florida man, who was a joke, right? There was always the punchline of Florida man did this. Florida man caught on the intercoastal naked wrestling an alligator. Florida man this, that, the other thing. Florida man, while it was a joke to some degree, Florida man did know something. And I think a lot of us are learning what that thing is, which is that Florida man cared about freedom. Florida man cared about liberty and, and don't tread on me. And that spirit is so alive. It's so strong here. The people are happy. I mean, I'm telling you, wherever I go, the amount of welcome to Florida, Dave, we're so happy you're here. I was at Whole Foods and I got mobbed by people. A woman wanted to buy my groceries. I had about $400 worth of groceries stocking up the house after the move. And I was like, you Which cannot. like one bag of Whole yeah, Foods. You, right, yeah, right. That's one bag at Whole yeah. Foods. I know. Um, but, but I was like, no, you can't buy my food. But thank you for welcoming me. There's just a... There is a fundamentally human part of all of us that yearns to be free. That's what the human story is, and that's what it's always been. And it's being stifled in places like California. So having left California where, you know, I was under all of these ridiculous edicts from Newsom and Garcetti was the mayor of L.A. Uh, but Jenna, as you may know, three days after the recall in September, and I had campaigned with Larry Elder, three days after the recall, I got audited by the state. So how much more... How much more do you need to know about what's going on in California? So I am very, very happy to be here. And to be clear, as I have told everybody, I am here to keep Florida, Florida. Good. And Florida and that attitude really is the spirit of America. And I think people are looking at Florida and with some jealousy and some, uh, I think, hope as well to say, why isn't this spirit now pervading all other Republican-led states. Uh, like if you look at Texas right now, I was just uh, last week in Texas campaigning with Don Huffines, uh, who is running against Governor Abbott, because people tend to contrast 
the rhinos like Abbott who won't stand up for freedom and won't uh, close his border, won't go against CRT in schools, won't even uh, come forward with legislation on chemical castration of children. I mean, you know, ridiculous things that sh that just should be obvious. They tend to compare rhinos like Abbott to the idiots like Gavin Newsom and say, look, we have such a great governor. But what they should be doing is comparing Abbott to people like Ron DeSantis and saying, wait a second, the Ron DeSantis who is showing everyone what it means to be free that needs to be the standard for all of the states across America. And so as you look at the people who are there in Florida, and I love your description of Florida man, because it's totally true. If you Google it, the Florida man, there's always yeah. something like your birthday and Florida man. Hilarious. It's like, that's your title. Um, but but that idea is is so amazing in America. Do you think that that is spreading to Republicans and to the party and to conservatism overall? I do. Or is this kind of just in Florida? I do, and I know your frustrations with Abbott, and I've heard that from other people in Texas. And look, Texas is way better than the blue states, but yes, is, is the stuff not as secure as it should be? Of course, and by the stuff, I mean, you know, the, the battle against wokeness, making sure the borders are okay, making sure the federal government isn't endlessly encroaching on every single thing. Has Abbott done some things right? Yes. Could he be stronger? Yes. So to your point, I think what DeSantis is doing quite well is that he is modeling what a governor is supposed to look like. And if we just look back on the founding documents, you know, the president is not supposed to have that much power. He certainly is not supposed to have as much power as he seemingly has right now. And look what happens when you give the president that much power. He can do all sorts of terrible things. This insane withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we don't even talk about anymore, regardless of whether you think we should have been there in the first place or were there for too long or any of that stuff. You know, the, the inflation, supply chain, all, you know, wokeness everywhere. You know, I'm going to only nominate a black woman as a Supreme Court justice, which actually is against the Civil Rights Act. I mean, all of the stuff, he shouldn't have that much power. The power should be with the governors. I think one thing that DeSantis is doing quite well is DeSantis is saying, hey, I am here to govern the people of Florida, but I don't want to rule over them. I want to create the conditions that are possible so they can live their lives the best way they see fit. He's doing an incredibly good job of it. I've, I've been able to have dinner with him twice. And I can tell you this, like I've met a lot of politicians. I know you've met a lot of politicians. I don't get the sense that this guy is in it for ego or because he desires to rule people. He really is just a seemingly pretty decent guy who has somehow, you know, some people, some people chase glory and some people just kind of become relevant by doing what they think is right. And I think he's the latter. He's a good guy. And I think the more that he shows people, you know, you can stand up to the system just because the CDC says this, the NIH says this, and Fauci says this, and CNN tells you that you don't have to listen to all of it. You can actually do what you think is right. And if you look back, you know, in these two crazy years of COVID, it's like, look back to two years ago, DeSantis has been remarkably consistent in what he was saying. He was always erring on the side of let's not destroy everything in the name of this disease. And that's looking pretty good right now to the point that liberals now, the few remaining somewhat sane liberals, and there's not many of them, they're just now repeating Ron DeSantis talking points. So it tells you who was kind of right about all this stuff. Yeah, and it certainly wasn't L.A. County. And, you know, to your <laughs> oh. point, I mean, that was L.A. County was such a disaster. And that, of course, was the battleground for the John MacArthur case and the church victory uh, that I was a part of. But it yeah. was shocking to me, Dave, to see um, a few days ago how uh, Eric Garcetti came out uh, with this justification for not following the mask mandate by saying, well, I was holding my breath while I was taking this picture. I mean, who is listening to these idiots anymore? There, there's no other way to describe them. You know, every day on my show, we have sort of a running joke with my crew. It's like, what other words are there to describe these people? You can call them sellouts. You can call them idiots and hacks and morons and like just a bunch of pejorative terms. But I don't know what's left to say about them. Eric Garcetti literally, uh, he literally said that when he takes pictures with people, he does it. He holds his breath. And it's like, first off, that's just simply not true. It's just a lie, period. It's Bill Clinton, I did not inhale, it's a lie. But putting aside that it's a lie, he then said, so I'm 100% safe, something to that effect. And it's like, really? Because if someone comes up to you and they say, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to take a picture with you, which by the way, if anyone wants to take a picture with this guy, they should have their head examined anyway. But it's like, if they take a picture with the guy, you've spoke to him, now he inhales, he most likely just inhaled all of the germs and now he's holding it. 
everything that they say is a lie. If Gavin Newsom says something, it's a lie. If Eric Arcetti says something, it's a lie. They have gone so in on this insanity, but there is one reason they get away with it. And the reason they get away with it is because there is one privilege in the United States, which is liberal privilege. They can say whatever they want and the media, just, oh my God, he holds his breath while he's taking pictures. That makes scientific sense. But meanwhile, obviously, if any of us or anyone that wasn't just, you know, a completely broken wokester said something like that, imagine if Trump said that. I mean, really imagine if Trump said, at the, oh. you know, during the pandemic, well, I still take pictures with people, I just hold my breath. Well, first off, Trump would have said it as a joke, right? And people would have taken it not as a joke. They would have said, oh, he's, he's killing people. But they'd be yeah, talking about impeachment right six. Now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like these people are clowns. I, I don't know what you do with them other than leave. Yeah. And, and you're so right that there isn't a descriptive pejorative term strong enough to describe the insanity that's going on. I mean, I was talking to a friend the other day just saying, you know, this is clown world. This is insane. And she was like, we got to have a word that's stronger than insane because that's not actually descriptive enough. And well, because because what is it if you just lie? Forget about politics for a second. If you just have a friend in your life who just lies about everything all the time, someone, you know, that just lie. Well, first off, if it was a business associate or a friend, you would, you would ultimately cut them out of your life. You would just say, no, 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 I've caught you in too many of these lies. You can try to confront them, right? You can try to say, no, you have to stop lying, which is why people like us, I, you know, I play Saki clips on my show every day. The woman can't say a simple, declarative, honest statement. She cannot do it. If you said to her, what's her favorite number? She would say blue. She cannot say anything true. So what should we do with these people? It's, we can call them liars. We can expose their lies. But what I'm more interested in at the moment, really from a, and I really mean this from a psychological level, is what could have happened along the way. Is the, is the woke ideology so pervasive that you got to give it credit that it has completely demolished your faculties, that you, Eric Garcetti, can walk on stage, say that you hold your breath for selfies and that's scientifically sound and you can believe your own nonsense. Like, that's pretty remarkable, actually. It is. And, you know, I was thinking about that even watching the last uh, couple of times that Joe Biden has deigned to come on the public stage. And um, a few times he'll answer reporters' questions, but, uh, you know, then mock them behind their back uh, on, a, on a hot mic and, you know, the jobs report uh, propaganda. And, and it's so fascinating to me to see that they're trying to play to the public narrative and have this spin, which is all that Jen Psaki does. But really, they're not interested in the, their approval ratings. They're not interested in what the public actually thinks about them. And they're not interested in having the voters or even their own party support them because this is all about power. What you just said, Dave, a few minutes ago about Ron DeSantis, I loved that where he is just the average guy that wants to make a difference. He doesn't want power for power's sake or for himself. It's that he genuinely wants to be one of the people that is protecting freedom and liberty for everybody else. And that's what our founders originally ordained with saying, we will be a citizen-led government. And what's happening is we have these oligarchs, whether it's the tech oligarchs, these people who are in power, they are taking hold of executive level authority, and they're using this under the auspices of the pandemic. And they're simply saying, we're not giving it back. I mean, people like Eric Garcetti, I think, know that, he's in, that, that his justification is stupid, but he just doesn't care because he's going to continue to break the rules and yet try to enforce them against everybody else. So why are we even paying attention to what any of these people say in the media instead of their actions that are so blatantly unconstitutional? Right. Well, that's why the solution to me is if you, if you list, believe anything that you or I have just said here, and you live in Los Angeles, or you live in San Francisco, or I would say DC or Seattle or New York City or any of these places, go. It is time to go. You don't wanna be the last guy in Dodge. I would recommend you watch the movie Fiddler on the Roof, and they left at the end. At some point, it's time to go and build a better life. That, that's how Fiddler ends. These people realize that you know the Cossacks aren't going to ever leave them alone in their shtetls, and they go and they explore the new country. You know, there's a really moving moment at the end where uh, one guy says to the other, you know, I'm going to Chicago, I'm going to New York. And it's like, they don't even know what that means, actually. You know, they live in Eastern Europe in these little nothing hovels, but it's like, it's not good here anymore, it's time to go. Let them have their cities. It's, it's unfortunate, but let them have it. Let them wreck them. And then by the way, eventually it'll be cleaned up by some scary person like us. Let's not forget, 
Dinkins, Mayor Dinkins in New York City, and I grew up outside of the city in Long Island, but I lived in New York City most of my adult life. Um, Mayor Dinkins was a far left progressive who took over after Ed Koch, who was sort of a pretty much a moderate Democrat, had some Republican, you know, he was always, his catchphrase was always, how am I doing? Because he was really a man of the people. He was a populist in New York. Then they bring in this far lefty David Dinkins who wrecks New York City. And then, as you know, who fixed New York City? It was a scary guy by the name of Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani. who said, Mm -hmm. we're going to have police do things like policing and we're going to make sure that you can't sell drugs on the street and we're not going to. Uh, allow homeless people to take over Times Square and everything else. So these things will come back, but they're not coming back for a while. And at the root of that really is when you talk about Garcetti in power, it's like, what what is the fundamental difference between people on the right and the left? And I get that right and left doesn't really make sense in traditional ways. And Trump really changed the entire, the entire chessboard and the entire system, the way we look at politics. But the basic way to look at it is some people believe in freedom, they believe in individual rights, and that you should make decisions for yourself. And then we can talk about how culture plays into that and religion and belief in all of those things. But the basic idea is that society starts with you as the individual. That's what people on the right broadly agree on. Conservatives, libertarians, even even classical liberals, true liberals who have nothing to do with wokeism. Then you have people on the left and the modern liberal and the modern liberal, what are they? What is the fundamental tenet of what they believe? It really is just, I'd like to do stuff. It's like, I government exists, and I would like to push it in a direction that does more of the stuff that I like. If there's no there's no basis for it other than, oh, there's a thing of power, and I would like to guide power. That's a very fundamentally different way of looking at the world. It's very clear which side of that I fall on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's clear what side the founders fell on as well when they recognized absolutely. that rights are individual. It's not about collective power. And even their phrasing on the left of, you know, amid to COVID, we're all in this together, this sort of collective responsibility, the notions of collective guilt, and even the CRT that you are guilty just if you are part of one specific group and you have to have this uh, collective apology apology and you have to apologize on behalf of your group. This is all not just groupthink, but it's also about uh, recognizing that there is a fundamental difference between the leftist progressive ideology that says that society exists to further a collective goal and whether or not you are part of that doesn't really matter and it's not about your individual rights. I mean, they're going so far as to say, I mean, and this is a real headline, that people are saying that children don't even belong to families anymore, that children belong to society. This is where they're going and they're trying to eradicate the individual rights, but also the definition of just being an individual. And this is scary. What you're referring to there is a, was an MSNBC commercial from about eight years ago. And I remember when it came out, it was, uh, what's her name? Melissa Harris Perry or something to that effect. Uh, she had this commercial where they, in essence, said, but by the way, you shouldn't be surprised about this because Hillary Clinton, it takes a village. I mean, these people have been saying this stuff forever. We sort of own your life. The system can organize your life and your children and your set of beliefs. And don't really focus on what you think because we can do a better job than you can. That is the recipe for abject human disaster. So you know, there are good signs right now. You know, the, this pushback against the woke at schools, Glenn Youngkin winning in Virginia, obviously. The fact that most of the polls show that Republicans are going to take back the House and maybe even the Senate, and it's going to be like pretty, pretty damn conclusive. Although, you know, you, know, you don't want to count your chickens before they hatch, obviously. But that enough people. Well, that hindsight is 2020. <laughs> well, look, right. Well, look at, right. So look at this, though. So uh, you may have seen that clip of uh, Barry Weiss, formerly of the New York Times on Bill Maher about two weeks ago. Now, Barry is sort of a non-woke leftist. And she's sort of in that Bill Maher group, which I always find to be sometimes the most frustrating people because it's like, you guys pretty much get it, but you still think that Republicans are all racists and morons and whatever. But you at least call out your side. And it's like, well, what do we do? This would be, I don't know what the answer to this is, but what I'm trying to do with these people is show them, hey, Bill Maher, Barry Weiss, you, you somewhat sane liberals who believe in free speech or... You, you don't believe in identity politics and collectivism. The natural place for you, of course, is on the right. Of course, is. it doesn't mean you have to be a conservative and, and, a, and a card carrying member of the Republican Party. Right. Like you can obviously have differences. By the way, that guy, Rudy Giuliani, who we just mentioned, 
Rudy is begrudgingly pro-choice. Uh, you know, he is for at least a few weeks there. That does exist on the right. Now, I know you aren't and that's fine. You know, but the point is that people on the right are willing to agree to disagree. They're willing and to have, have the conversations. I've had many conversations with Mayor Giuliani about exactly that. And guess what? We can still actually move forward as friends and have the same uh, goals on other things for the party. Exactly. And we that's, allow that open disagreement. And that's what I'm trying to do with, say, the Bill Maher types, these last liberal types, these people that thought that the New York Times was the Bible, but they never fully went bananas woke. I'm trying to show them, hey, guys, and I mean, Bill Maher, he's been talking about it for the last couple of weeks. It's like his audience is now starting to become conservative. Well, Bill, you're going to have to grapple with the fact that you called these people racists for so long and backwards because they're religious and everything else. But isn't that something? It's the religious people who are defending the liberty of the avowed liberal atheist. You got to love it. Yeah, always, always the irony. And and what you're saying is so true. It, do you think, though, Dave, that there is a danger on the right, even though Trump completely transformed the party, he looked in and, and shined the light on truly the decrepit swamp that it is, and he makes people get off the fence and actually declare where they stand. Um, he was the president for the time in 2016. Um, even in 2020, uh, look at the disaster that Biden is. Um, but I'm also seeing there is a prevalence on the Trump right that is getting into this entrenched mentality that they can't go against anything that they perceive that MAGA world is for. Do you think that there is a concern there if Trump runs again that people like the Ron DeSantis's won't because there is this, whether they, you know, the left will call it a cult mentality. I don't think it's that far, but there is kind of this entrenched mentality or how do we combat that necessarily on the right? Right, well, first off, if you wanna talk about cult mentality, I mean, have you ever met Bernie bros and the way that the DNC had to smack these people down because they really were cult members because of the, the all conforming collective socialist ideology. Uh, but you're bringing up a really interesting point and, and the Republicans and conservatives, whatever, whatever you wanna call it, really have to figure this out and have to figure it out soon so that it doesn't dominate whatever is gonna happen over the next two years. So look, my preference, personally, as a new Floridian, is I think Ron DeSantis is doing such a spectacular job here. And I think that your state should and does matter more than the federal government, that my personal preference would be that Ron DeSantis stays as governor of Florida. I, I think let's continue to strengthen the model that is right, that then we can export to the other states and make guys like Abbott or whoever maybe becomes the next Texas governor show him, hey, look at that shining beacon over there. And he won re-election by a landslide and he's doing it right and you're doing it right there. And that keeps the federalist system going. Now, that being said, obviously a lot of people are saying DeSantis should run. There's this other portion that are saying, no, it has to be Trump. I think that, that look, everything being equal, if they could find somebody else that was pretty good, I'm not even sure who it is. Maybe it's a Tim Scott type. I, I, I don't know who it is. Let's just put aside the specific person for a second. If they could find someone that was just like pretty good, really like basically got the issues and was a pretty decent person. And then Trump could say, hey, I'll still run the rallies. I'll have all the fun. I'll fight the media. I'm going to do all of that stuff because I'm going to act as the bodyguard because that way when the entire evil machine of the corporate media and the whole thing comes after this person, I'll be the force field. And this guy can just walk right through. Now, maybe that person will be DeSantis. Maybe it will be, even though, as, as I'm saying, I would prefer he stay here. But if Trump could do that, it's like, wow, what a great, maybe not ending, but what a great next chapter in the Trump story. Now, Trump may want to run. He may want to run. I think if he does want to run, I mean, most likely I'll support him, uh, you know, unless there's another amazing Republican. I'm obviously not voting for a Democrat. But, but what Trump has to grapple with that I don't think that they've addressed really enough is if you believe that the election was stolen or there was some malfeasance, whatever it is, as he obviously still says, well, it doesn't make sense to run unless you have addressed it somehow, unless you've done something so that it can't happen again. Otherwise, why wouldn't the system just do it again? So putting aside whether it's true or not, whether it's nonsense or not, he has a real issue that he has to figure out there, which is, hey, I'm going to run. OK, great. But why wouldn't they just do it again? Your audience is going to be like, wait a minute, dude, did, did you fix that thing? So I think the Republicans have a lot of things to think about. But, but by and large, I would say this is a good set of problems.
Yeah, and I think that you're absolutely right that addressing election integrity is not only a key issue for a lot of the grassroots, but it also has to be a key issue that any Republican nominee, whether it's Trump or someone else, is going to have to address. And that's why there are so many people who are saying, you know, we have to fix 2020 before we move along. I I don't think that. I think that we need to at least just fix what has been broken and make sure that the states understand their responsibilities. We actually make sure that we're protecting the sanctity of the ballot, but we have to be confident in that moving forward. Otherwise, you're right, it doesn't quite make sense. And um, But I love when you- Yeah, and, and Jenna, by the way, there, there's one other piece to the Trump thing, which is that Biden is so wounded right now, his approval ratings are so low, despite the, the media trying to prop him up and everything else, that if there was ever an opportunity for just sort of like a decent Republican to walk through, again, if Trump could do the thing, it's like, this is the opportunity. The other risk that Trump has is that whether it's true or not, look, I came to like Trump a lot, you know, personally and as a, as a politician, but, what, but the amount of people who will be juiced up and angry, who maybe we're gonna not vote, maybe we're gonna sit it out, but now Hitler is back, and then that you're gonna excite their base again. So there really is an opportunity. I would hope, and I, I don't know that this is on the horizon, but I would hope that Trump and DeSantis and the, say, 10 other people that are maybes could all sit down and be like, guys, let's really do this a different way this time. Let's really look at the whole system in a holistic way and who can do what and where can they be best suited. That's actually something that Trump is kind of good at, right? Like that feels a little bit like the host of The Apprentice. So I hope Trump is watching the Jenna Ellis show today. <laughs> the the art of the deal, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what he's known for. And, and you're right. And I love what you said um, earlier about the emphasis on state sovereignty and the model and the beacon that Florida is. And I've heard a lot of people in Florida say that same thing, that they don't want to lose their great governor. And the thing, you know, and, and when I was out in Texas, I was also answering some of these questions, um, you know, with some of the people that I met and they said, you know, well, I don't know whether where I would want DeSantis in Florida or in the White House. And I said, well, why are we thinking that he's the only person that could do either one of these jobs? I mean, I think that we're seeing that there is such a resurgence among these average Americans that understand government and are willing to go in and say, wait a minute, I want to actually do the business of governing, not because I want the power, but because I want to protect people's rights. And so I think we have a large bench to actually pull from more so than we did before President Trump was elected in 2016, because we are getting rid of and hopefully continuing to remove the establishment Republicans and the party is trending toward genuine conservatives. So I hope that we're not in, by the time we get to 2024, I hope we're not just talking about Trump and DeSantis, we can add 10 other names to that list of people who are doing such a great job of governing and that we are focusing on state sovereignty. So I know that um, I only have a few more minutes with you, yeah. Dave. So uh, where can people find you? Uh, how can they continue to listen to the Rubin Report? And, you know, as President Trump is listening now, this is your opportunity to tell him <laughs> where to find you too. <laughs> Yo, Don, long time no see, man. Uh, you can go to rubinreport.locals.com. You know, I don't like just talking about these issues, I like doing something. So I started Locals.com to, to fight big tech. We've since merged with Rumble.com and we're, we're really building the alternate rails of the internet and we're gonna fight big tech not by having the government bring regulators in to look at the YouTube algorithm. We're gonna fight big tech by building better products. So I'm really proud of what we built there and uh, that's where I do all my communicating with people. I don't deal with people on Twitter anymore. I can't, you know, it's just so much noise and lunacy but I communicate directly with people. I have drinks with my audience and we walk the dogs together and all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. And I love that you're a real American who really cares and keep up the great work. And thanks so much for being on the show. Always great to talk with you and uh, have these conversations because it is about doing, not just talking and you are walking that walk. So thank you for everything you're doing. Great to see you, Jenna. But first, Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to 
protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903.